Hi, y'all. This is Kristen Chenoweth. Hi, I'm Gloria Stefan. This is Sarah Bareilles. Hi, I'm Patty Lapone. This is Lynn Manuel Miranda. You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Hello, I'm Mary Testa. Welcome to the Theater Podcast with Alan Seals. Hello, everyone, and welcome to an all new episode of the Theater Podcast. Happy July. Can you believe 2024 is half over? Time for the next Tony season to kick in, am I right? Anyway, I'm Alan Seals, and this episode's guest is another Broadway legend, multiple Tony Award nominee, Mary Testa, with an almost 50-year career spanning TV, film, voiceover work, and of course, the stage. Something I love most about her is that, in a good way, she just doesn't seem to care what other people think. She goes into a project bringing her own unique self to the role, something that obviously continues to serve her well. And she is also a continued part of Twits, a radio play produced here on Broadway Podcast Network, of which season two was just recently released. So make sure to check out the show notes for more information on that or find it wherever you're listening to this podcast now. You'll thank me later. So find me online on the socials. Leave a rating, please. It helps the podcast grow. And everyone, please enjoy this episode now with Mary Testa. Here you go. One, two, three. Our guest today is in the middle of her phenomenal career spanning a few decades that includes 12 Broadway shows such as Oklahoma, 42nd Street, and On the Town, resulting in her three Tony Award nominations. TV and film credits beginning in 1979 include Cagney and Lacey, Sex and the City, the original one, folks, Whoopi, The Batteries Down, Eat, Pray, Love, and The Good Fight, The Blacklist, and literally 56 more. No joke. She's been a part of the Ratatouille TikTok musical, uh, is an experienced voiceover artist, can be heard in the upcoming podcast comedy twits and all around just one of my favorite people to watch on stage mary testa welcome to the theater podcast thank you that's quite an intro thank you of course and i just want to say too that we are sitting in your apartment yeah yeah we're sitting in my bedroom yeah (laughs) because i have two birds who tweet all the time so we're in the bedroom because they're in the living room not social media tweets actual (laughs) actual tweeting actual birds i love I, i love the physical connection um that that being in person with somebody and being able to look at them and look at them in the eye for real. I mean, you're looking at yeah. them in the eye over the camera anyway. But to be able to to really look somebody in the eye and and make that connection, I think, is part of why pe- people love theater in general. Sure. Yeah. Right. So, like, I think that's probably a wonderful place to move back to uh, to get started on your history, right? Because um, tell us about where you grew up, what got you into theater? I grew up in Rhode Island. Um, I was born in Philadelphia, but we moved back to Philadelphia. My parents were both from Rhode Island, and we moved back to Rhode Island when I was four, so I grew up there. And I, while I was a teenager, really decided that I wanted to to be an actor. Um, I decided between law and acting, and I decided to do acting. So I went to college at the University of Rhode Island and majored in theater. I took all my theater credits by the time I finished my first semester junior year and worked three jobs for a summer to save up and move to New York in 1976. Have been here ever since, hit the ground running. Uh, I worked a regular job for three years as well as I, as soon as I moved to New York, started uh, working with Bill Finn, who I had worked with when I was in college, and In Trousers, which was my first show, which was Bill's first show here in New York. Wow. So that sort of started that whole thing, but I had to work a job to pay rent. And for three years, I worked as a cashier and then a waitress at a place called U.S. Steakhouse, which was in the ground floor of the Time Life Building. And it was a great job. And then I got this six-week workshop, which was a Stuart Ostro-funded workshop where we did a new musical theater review every week. There was a cast of actors, a group of writers, a director. And um, I went to my bosses, my waitress job was a union job and I went to my bosses who hated me and (laughs) said can I have a leave of absence and they were like no so I went back to all my waiter friends and they said to me you didn't come here to be a waiter you came here to be an actor so I quit I said then I quit and I never ever knock on wood had to have another job again I just was an actor from wow yeah it was pretty great move back to the 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 choice between law school and performing yeah because why 
why law? Those are very different yes. career well, paths. Well, not really, because when you're a lawyer, you have to be a good actor. I, um, <laughs> I have always been the type of, I was always this way, even when I was young, that when I see something that I think is not fair or unjust, I speak up about it. So I think that's where law came into my head, um, that if I was able to represent people, that I would be a good uh, representation of the truth and re- and moral right. Um, but then, you know, I always sang because my mother and I used to sing together when I was little. So I decided, you know, if I become a lawyer, I've got to go to school for quite a long time. Yeah. And if I'm an actor, I don't just go to school that long. And that's really <laughs> where the decision came. <laughs> when when were you, uh, how, how young were you when you started singing? I mean... Very young, was very it, young. Was it all just for fun? Like Yeah, my mother, my mother was a singer, not professionally. Um, my mother, I have told this story a million times, but my mother, my aunt my aunt Tony and a friend of theirs had a singing group called the Gay Sisters and they did this talent competition at the Biltmore Hotel in Providence, Rhode Island, which was a big deal. And they won um, a contract to tour with the big band for a year and they went home and asked my grandfather and he was like, no, no. So oh, that wow. ended that. That was that was it. So my mother always sang with me from when I was very young and she'd say okay now you do the harmony and I would just do the harmony so we sang together all the time and that's kind of how it happened do you remember the first musical theater show you got to take part in um when I was in high school there wasn't a drama department we started it now that high school calls the drama t- I'm probably the most famous person that's come out of that high school and they don't even use my name but you know <laughs> it's all good um so <laughs> we're not bitter it, we yeah. made our own musical we made our own show up but um in college uh I did a bunch of stuff and that's where I met Bill Finn um and his show was called Scrambled Eggs so that's where I met him um but the but I did a show here while I was still in college called The Resurrection of Jackie Kramer that was at New Dramatists and I was still a college student, came up, did the show. I played a 55-year-old woman, and this agent was waiting for me afterwards. Wait, you were in your 20s playing 55? I was younger than that. I was probably 18, 19. Wow, okay. Yeah, because um, yeah, I'm a character actor, so I, and I've always been. He wanted to talk to me, and you know, I was, I was only up here to do that show, and then I was going back to school. Um, I ended up not working with him, but... Um, yeah, that was the first sort of show I did here in New York. You know, that wasn't, it was, I think it was, I don't even remember. I mean, it was probably like a showcase or something. And then went back to college, quit, and then came here, and then in trousers happened. So it, so that was the first sort of professional thing was in trousers, I think. That's insane. So you hit the ground running, and it, has your experience always been sort of... Um, that the the previous project leads you to the next like you're always you know, yeah. work lined up back to back they, well, Aside, sometimes i do but not, not always like right now i don't have i have some readings coming up but that's it um i last year i had a, a year where i sort of knew what i was doing you know i had oliver at city center and then i had uh i did a new brain up in at barrington stage and then came and did gardens of annuncia so i kind of had my year sort of set but it's not always that way but i don't ever stress because um, you know, whatever comes my way, if it's interesting to me, I'll do. And I've also decided, after all these years, um, I'm good with just working on things I really love. Like, I'm not on that stardom path, and I never will be. I just like working on interesting things with people that I love. So that's, that's in- what I do. That's interesting. I mean, I-, I wonder why so many people get into performing, get fall in love with entertainment and the limelight at a young age. And I wonder, uh, speaking for myself too, I wanted the stardom path because I wanted to feel validated. Yeah. And I don't, uh, I, that's, that path is a di- very different path to take. And from, if, it involves some luck. It involves some, it involves a lot of things. I obviously know at this age that that's, probably not for that's probably not going to happen for me but I'm good I'm good I just worked on a television show the show the other day um Blue Bloods and uh this guy came up to me who was I think one of the writers or something he was like you are so familiar and I went and looked up your IMDb 
IMDB or IMDB, whatever IMDb, it's called. Yeah. He said, we've worked together six times. <laughs> he said, start, starting with the first movie I ever did was Going in Style, which was like in the 70s. Yeah. And he's like, I was a 16-year-old kid on that. Well, my dad was a grip. And it was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. So, you know, my longevity is is what I am proud of and what I will continue to do, you know. That's awesome. And I think it was actually Michael Urie that gave me the advice once, be the person that people want to work with the next time. Exactly. And he's divine. But he's on the, you know, he's like a, a star. I consider him more of a star. But, um, yeah, he's divine. He's just a cheerful, lovely, hilarious, very talented um, wonderful craftsman and you know it was a ball working with him because we did government inspector together right right yeah. and and then we recorded uh twits together yes which, which we'll get into yeah but I, I i wanted to touch on the the voice the voice career that you've got already yeah, it's not that big it's not that big my voiceover career not I at mean, all encourage the cowardly dog well that's you, you got... well that's something yeah but you know i always and i say this about television and film too i always visit but no one asks me to live there. <laughs> so my voiceover career was very haphazard. And then I just kind of, because I don't think I have the voice that people, like I have a lot of friends who've made a lot of money in voiceovers and their voices tend to be a little bit crackly, a little bit more forward in their faces. And I don't think I have that kind of voice. Plus, you know, over the years, I would I would maybe book one a year, maybe two. So it just wasn't for it wasn't for. And then I was like, this is a waste of my time. I keep going to these auditions, nothing. Else. So I was good. And then the people that I was working with, agent wise, they sort of stopped. And I'm like, I'm fine. I don't need to go to these appointments anymore. It's well, that, all good. That voice right there. That's your crackly forward voice. <laughs> Yeah, I don't need to. Yeah, uh, I need, yeah. I don't need to that go vocal to vocal fry. Yeah. yeah there you go. No, it's good. I, I don't. I'm not a big voiceover person, but I've done some. I've always wanted to. I've wanted to have like that's my dream career. Yeah. Is to is to do. But some it's sort very of... different now. Is it? It's changed now because there's a lot of non-union stuff. Interesting. Yeah, a lot of non-union stuff happening. It was. It was. It's been sort of, I guess, serendipitous or weird, whatever. I moved to New York to be an actor in 2007 during that writer's strike. Mm. And because I got my degree in computer science, I fell back on computers and I've never auditioned a single day in New York. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So I've been here 17 years now. And have you worked as and an I've actor? Never, not, not, not where I wasn't doing a friend a favor uh -huh. as a small role for free. And do right. you, are you happy with that? Or are you good with what you're doing? Or I feel like there's a piece of me that still isn't yeah. fulfilled. Well, let me tell you, you know? something. The thing about acting is there's no time limit. Like if you really wanted to go back into yeah. it, then you would go back into it. You know what I mean? There's no, there's no like, oh, you're this age now, you can't do it anymore. It's like there's a million possibilities. It's just about being tenacious. It's hard. It's hard to, yeah, tenacious and not giving up and... I actually just came from talking to Mark Summers, who was like, he never gave up no after no after no, because he literally, he's talked publicly about his OCD. He was mm -hmm. so obsessive compulsive that he had, like, that was his completion was to become a talk show host. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. Like, like. Uh, that's what he wanted to do. That's what he had to do. There you go. And, f and for me, it's, it's sort of the opposite is like, it's one of the things I can see myself doing. Mm -hmm. So I'm not putting all my eggs into that basket, which probably means that I I'm not going to get very far because the people who are putting all their eggs in that basket are going to continue to do sometimes that. Sometimes that the focus, you know, yeah. gets you where you need to go. But also sometimes if you do a bunch of things that you like doing, then you should do a bunch of things that you like doing. Fair. You know, uh, yeah. uh, because this is a hard business and um, not everybody's really cut out for it, you know, mentally. And, it, you know, it just takes a lot of... You have to have a really thick skin, but you also have to be completely vulnerable and open. And so that's like to do that <laughs> right. double, you know, it's it's not the easiest thing. Yeah. Um, we had, when I was doing Gardens of Annuncio, we had a couple, we had some student matinees that were, may I say, torturous. But, um, uh, and we had kids ask us, you know, like, I want to do this. Like, this looks like it's fun. I want to do it. And, you know, I said to this kid, well, then you need to study and you need to go and 
take classes and see what you're interested in. But also, it's not easy. Right. It's not easy. It looks easy, but it's not easy. So, you know, who knows? I mean, who knows? What that's is. that's the hard part that I think a lot of people don't get is that to be good, even when you already are good, the people who are good are continu- continually taking classes and they're always learning and trying to, to get that much better. So people, you I mean, you hear about every now and then an overnight success story, but that's one in how many millions oh, yeah. and it's millions It usually of takes a really long time to yeah. get a foot in. And I, it's also different with television and film because it also depends on what you look like. Right. Um, so if you're classic, I mean, I was looking at all the people that were, you know, regulars on Blue Bloods that I worked with the other day. You know, they were all really skinny and they were all really pretty. And, you know, and it's like, okay, that's not, me that's not what i am but i get that you know i understand that that's kind of part of the visual of television the visual of film it's changing a little bit and there are some people who are more characters who work steadily in television and film but it's not always there's not always that door doesn't always open so don't go anywhere we'll be right back after this break welcome back to the episode is it is it easier, or I guess do you enjoy it more now um, that everything is is shifted to online, like a lot of self tapes? That, uh, like I see, you know, you've got your I ring know, light I hate over it. there. Oh, well, you know, when the whole it, pandemic happened, I said to my agent, "Look, um, when we we had to start doing self tapes for auditions, um, I am not. This is not my job. Okay." So if you want me to go out and audition for all these projects, you you've got to figure out how this happens because I'm live alone. Yeah. I don't have anybody to read with me. Um and I'm really technologically challenged. So my wonderful agent, Chris Foster, one of them, um said, "Okay, I will send you a Zoom link. I will read with you and film you, and then I will send it in." So that's what we do. There you go. So I don't have to edit i don't i'm so bad i couldn't even upload some documents the other day (laughs) for somebody who needed it like a job i need to do that i can't i'm so bad so i'm that works for us yeah and i got a ring light and an ipad stand and that's how it and that's how i do my auditions and that works so go figure well okay so everything's moving online a lot of things are getting cast a lot of people now are getting cast from their social media i know i know so i'm just going to turn the recorder off Okay, just you and me. <laughs> what do you really feel? How do you, I mean, how do you feel about the the shift in that? Because starting in, you know, you said your first credit, you moved to New York in 76? Yeah. You said, right? And 76, your first Broadway Broadway show was, I think it's 79? 80. 80, 1980, okay. yeah. So then you've seen just this these massive shifts. And, yeah. and last time I really had a good conversation about this, I, I mean, I enjoy, like Nancy Opal was one of my first guests years yeah. ago. And that, she was... That was 2018, right? And even then, that was before TikTok. Yeah. So, I love TikTok. <laughs> do you? I love TikTok. And I'll tell you why. There's a little side street here. I don't even watch television anymore wow. because I am so entertained by TikTok and I'm also informed by TikTok and I've learned an incredible amount of things. And there are really smart people like virologists and medical people and political people who are on TikTok, who I get all my news from. I I know everything that's going on. I am very well aware of um, COVID-19 and when it's peaking and when it isn't. (laughs) I am um, very entertained by some people that are on there. And I'm also, there's life hacks, there's recipes. I am, I love TikTok. People make fun of me, but I don't care. I I love it. I don't I will never make a TikTok. I will never do a, uh, no, never. Uh, I, no one needs to hear my opinion on, I will never make it, but I love watching it. Love it. My advice, and I need to take my own advice, is just do reaction videos. So you're duetting with I, I, with somebody else, and all you do is just sit there and nod and smile. I don't need to do that. I don't need to have that presence. That I don't need that at all. As a matter of fact, like my, I do have an Instagram, and I don't do it. I hired somebody to do it. Yeah. Because I wouldn't do it if, yeah. I, if I did. And I never take, like, I'm also the kind of person who never takes pictures with everybody that I'm working with. I mean, I do occasionally. But, like, I know almost everybody on on Instagram, like, when they're doing a television show, they'll take a picture with the star. Yeah. And they'll pa- I never do that. Never. Interesting. The guy who does my TikToks, like, 
I mean, uh, my Instagram is like, can you get a picture with, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'll try. I always say, and most of the time I don't. So <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, it's it's funny. Yeah, the stuff I've tried being a brand account, I've tried like just posting with the podcast here, right? And the stuff that always gets the most likes is 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 a face. It's a, a my face or the guest's face or talking heads. People don't want to be advertised to anymore. Uh, but I get yeah. occasionally, occasionally, not a lot. I'll get like, whoa, we've been looking at your Instagram and we think you'd be the perfect person. Oh, the ambassador to, for I'm my like, jewelry. I'm like, I'm not selling anything. Nope. I don't want to sell anything. That's not why I'm, I'm not interested in that. No. I'm not interested in doing, you know, hey, I love this sweater and you can get 20%. I'm not interested in any of that. Mm-mm. So that's not going to happen for no, me either. No, no, no. I don't yeah. like that at all. Uh, but I mean, I guess the, back to the original question though. I mean, do you think it it's... Uh, a good thing for the theater industry, the Broadway industry, to be casting and discovering off of social media? I think it's better to be in the room. I think it's better to be in person. But I understand, like, for preliminary, I think it's okay to do uh, self-tapes, you know? I mean, I think it's good for them to do a self-tape and then say, this person interests me, let's bring them in the room and see how they are in the room live. Yeah. That's happened to me. I mean, I um, when I was up in Barrington, I had an audition for a cabaret that was, uh, you know, a self-tape, well, with my agent. And then they were like, we'd love to do a callback with you. And I had to come in and be in, I didn't get it, which is fine. But I, you know, but I was in the room, you know what I mean, with them. With and Eddie I, Redmayne, yeah. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's, not with Eddie Redmayne, but with, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but that's fine. Yeah. I mean, I'm good with that. I guess we have to kind of roll with it because it is what it is now. But, um, you know, and I'm very fortunate in that the people who know me, most of my jobs are offers. Mm-hmm. Um, I still have to obviously have to audition, but, you know, I get a fair amount of offers of things and that's fine with me. Yeah. That's well, real good. That's what I was going to ask next was how, how you go after your next project or how you choose which projects... To, to do i am not that i don't have that much of a plan I've, <laughs> I've said this many times before in interviews like i'm like a pinball whatever i hit up against i deal with so whatever comes my way um if it's something i'm interested in i will work on it if it's something i'm really not interested i'll say no but you know for the most part I like doing readings and those kind of things because that's kind of interesting and fun. And then if the project goes a certain way, then I'm like, mm, I don't need to do this. Yeah. Um, and I also don't need to do everything, like everything I'm offered, because I used to do that when I was younger. Anything anybody offered me, I said yes to. I was sometimes doing three things at once. Now I'm like, no, I don't need that. Thank you. That I'm helping you. You're not helping me kind of thing, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and... That's all good too, you know. That's good too. So, is it? I mean, you said you like readings. Is it? I do. Is it the? Um, I guess the freedom of that of not being bound into a character. I like readings where I do cold, where I read it cold. Really, I love that. That's like my favorite thing in the world. I once did a very. I'm not even going to tell you the playwright or, or anything. It was a really. It was from New York Theater Workshop, and it was um, a take on. Fiddler on the Roof, but it was a different take on it. And I didn't even realize, because I didn't read the script, how much I had to do. And I read it cold, and I was, excuse me, fucking brilliant. (laughs) (laughs) And the playwright sent me a message after, because it was just a one-day reading, and he was like, I can't thank you enough for bringing to life this character that I've had in my head. And I was like, okay. Thank you. I mean, that was so much fun. But I, I did. I read it cold that, a f- a in the Sarah? rehearsal, yeah. and then once I that the first time, and then we did it. You know, performed it. So I had read it once, so I knew what it, what the lay of the land was. But it was an intense and really crazy um, character. I think it's, in, I think it's important at this point to to call out though that people can't go in not having prepared to do a cold read. Cold reading, you still have to train and you take classes oh, yeah. and you you yeah. develop your craft. You yeah, don't you just can't show not be, up. No, no, no. But that's me because I enjoy that. Yeah. And I'm good at reading off the page. Like my head's not in the script. I'm I'm good at that because I've been doing this for 48 years. So I'm good at, I'm good at it. Yeah. You know, 
Um, but no, I wouldn't say don't ever read anything and go and call. But that just is what my preference is. Yeah. Um, you know, but I'm always very prepared for whatever the next steps are. I'm always prepared. What about something like Wicked? When you went into Wicked, mm-hmm. did you read the the lines? Did you read? I mean, that is a, such a well known IP. It's a well known property, well known story. How little do you watch the predecessor, or do you? Uh, come, I did I not get, watch. Yeah. I had saw the show when it was in previews. I didn't watch the. I think it was Carol Kane who was in before me. But you know, I was like eight nine ten years into wicked i mean i was you know morable number probably 850 you know what i mean there are many right. before me um but you know you have a rehearsal process when you go into a show like that i think it was like a two-week rehearsal process something like that really that long yeah they they rehearse you yeah because I, w- I was talking with um maybe it maybe it's a week i don't i don't remember i guess it was L- lily thomas i was talking to about when she went going into, into Chicago to be Mama Morton. And, and she said she met some of her castmates for the first time during her first show. Oh, that that makes sense because you don't rehearse with the company. Oh, you yeah, might have guess... one, you have a put in. Yeah. Where you have, where you work with the company, but your rehearsal process is not with the company, no. So you're going on a stage, possibly meeting your Elphaba and your Glinda for the first time in the scenes. Yeah, usually. Um, however, when I went in, the, everyone was going in. Like, they tend to, oh. to, you know what I mean? I don't remember the, pri- one week, two weeks, I don't remember, actually. Hmm. But you do get, in that instance, because it's a huge stage, you do get a put-in so that you are able to, like a dress rehearsal put-in. Without, yeah, the, a huge rehearsal so you don't get hit in the head with a yeah. set piece. And that's usually with the whole company, so... Because there's a lot of a lot of moving pieces at a lot there of these shows. There are a lot of moving pieces, yeah. So not a lot of moving pieces. Radio plays. Twits. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the last time I was here on the floor of your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we had to cram. I had to go out of town or something. And we had to cram all those episodes into one day. Remember? I know. I know. That was yeah. so much fun, though. Oh, my God. I had Middle a of COVID. So Tom, Tom Allen Robbins, writer, co-director, brilliant man. How do you know Tom? We had done a reading together many, many years ago. He made me laugh so hard. And I just have known him from the business. I don't think we've ever... Well, we did Government Inspector. Right. We were all in Government Inspector together. Michael Yuri, mm-hmm. bless his soul and rest in peace, Michael McGraw, who was just genius and, and passed this past year, um, which is a huge loss because he was just a brilliant, brilliant guy. Arnie Burton, I mean, Mary Lou Rosado... Uh, Taylene Monahan. I mean, it was an incredible company, and we had a ball. So, uh, Alan, uh, Tom asked me to do Twits after that. You know, he asked me to, and that's had several incarnations too. I know there was like a live performance, and then there's been uh, before we actually recorded it in podcast form. Were you involved with it beforehand, or did you come in? Uh, I. I... I I did like readings. Yeah. Like we did readings for Tom's writing group. Yeah, that's what it was. It was yeah. it was the writing yes. group. Yes, yeah, yeah. And just, you know, it's such a wonderful. And the cast, I mean, it was so much fun to record because everybody's so funny. It was um, you know, like Michael Urie and, and Christian Borle and Dakin, who was just so wonderful. And it's the only character that knows what's going on. Everybody else is, this is why it's called Twits. Yeah. Everybody else is just kind of <laughs> clueless. Um, but it was just so much fun to do, uh, to record. And, you know, when you're doing like a Zoom thing and you see other people's faces and stuff, it was just great fun. I enjoy, I really enjoy the... Uh, I guess the camaraderie that comes with putting a bunch of people together. Yeah. And it felt like a workshop to me. Yeah. That we just happened to record. Yeah, because totally. Because it, it was an, you know, audio form. It was low key. You know, there's no stage. There's no costumes. No. We're just all having fun. Totally. And then that wonderful guy who did the sound effects. Yeah. And put the sound in there. I mean, you know, come on. It's just, it was great fun. Yeah. And um, thinking back to the, the character actressness. Uh-huh. Of all of this, like, so uh, you you called yourself a character actress, you know, from the beginning, and you're always you always play these very strong willed individuals. Well, I and, think that's and, me, and so yeah. like that comes through in every, uh, you know, I don't know. I always said to Michael John, you know, Michael John Lacuse, who wrote Gardens of Annuncia, who I adore and think he's a genius, and I have worked with him. Uh, Gardens was my fifth show with him, and then we have two that are in the in the pipe, yeah. you know. Um, and I said to him once, I really need you 
to write me a really incredibly stupid character. <laughs> and he's like, no, you can't. No, you can't do that. And I said, no, I really can. I made him come to see Government Inspector because I played an incredibly stupid woman in Government Inspector. And I'm dying to do that. But I ha have a tendency to be cast in characters that are strong and strong-willed well, and and her patient's kind of stupid i mean from she twists, is she's from she's twists. yeah totally but I mean, she's like are. bossy and you know what i mean she has opinions and yeah they're all stupid they really are all stupid which is delightful delightfully stupid but um it, which is again why it's called twits um but yeah but that and i tend to do i tend to have those don't go anywhere we'll be right back after this break Welcome back to the episode. Do you, I mean, I get, I, I know the answer to this. It's a, it's kind of a silly question, but I want to hear your answer. Approaching every role, playing the truth of that character, playing the role. Because I've actually gotten into like sort of analyzing bad guys lately. Uh -huh. Bad um, people who think they are, I, I, everybody thinks they're doing right. Everybody wakes up yeah. in the morning and they're like, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I think is right today. Yeah. And some of those people happen to be evil you know yeah. for a lack of a better term right, right exactly and so when you're playing somebody uh, a stupid character somebody who is just less intelligent than one might hope they would be they're still doing everything they believe is right absolutely so you're now, still that's what you do as a human being you know i mean everybody has different levels of psychosis and you know uh i once said to a playwright who th thought i was crazy i said the biggest problem in the world is low self-esteem and she said to me oh mary that is really not true at all and i said i i beg to differ with you because so many people doubt themselves talk badly to themselves mm -hmm. so many people that's why there are tyrants and that is why because inside a tyrant is probably not so sure of themselves. Mm -hmm. And so they feel they have to strong arm in order to make their place in the world. I mean, there's all kinds of psychological levels, but right. I really believe that. I really believe that. And then as soon as you find peace and joy and know who you are and are able to go forward in the world with that, it the, the, the path becomes a different path. Did you have to uh, work through that yourself at all? Yeah. I mean, I still have moments where, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't know, but I'm very clear about who I am and and what I am and um and that makes and I'm comfortable in my own skin so that makes for a better so I don't take I try not to anyway take a lot of things personally I mean I take a lot of things personally what am I talking about but <laughs> but you know I don't take rejection personally because I'm like okay I wasn't your thing all good was it always like that or did you have to develop um, that I was pretty good about that um I was pretty good about it which is why I don't stress. Um, and also I'm at a certain stage of life where, you know, I don't need to stress as much financially, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's a big thing to be comfortable in your own skin and know who you are. I think that's a big thing. Well, it's embracing what makes you unique and what makes you different. And when you, yeah. I think when you, when people can get Un, uh, comfortable leaning into what makes them different from everybody else instead yeah. of trying to be Kristen right. Chenoweth or be Idina Menzel. Exactly. Right? They're, they're, they're brilliant and wonderful and they are their own things. But everyone is interesting and everyone is an individual. And I've said this to young kids. Don't try, don't walk into an audition room and do it for the people behind the desk. Walk into an audition room and do it for yourself. Yeah. And try just try to be the best you can be in that moment for yourself. Because if you try and second guess what any of those people want, you're not being authentic in any way, shape, or form. That's what that's something I I, I wish I could remember who said this and give them credit, but I can't remember. It, something else that I heard through one of these podcast episodes uh, interviews was uh, somebody had said that when you go in to do an audition, you're doing it, you're doing it pretending you've already got the job. You're doing it to have fun and exactly. it's for you that's right. and it's for you and you're showing everybody else that it's already your job yeah that's exactly right because a lot of the times they don't know what they want they want they want somebody to walk yeah. in the room and convince them you know they may think they want something yeah. and then they see your version of it or they may have a clear picture in their head of what it looks like to them you walk in and you're not that picture but you're great 
you're still not going to get the job how great you are because they have a picture in their head of what they want. You never know. So you can't second guess and that And then they stuff. call you back for the next project. Maybe. They remember the you for the next... the person that yeah. they want to work with the next time. They may remember you the next time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I, I've, seen, I've heard of that so many times of like, you weren't right for this role, but we remembered you because you made such a great choice. Exactly, exactly. That now That's we're going right. to call you back in for the next yeah, one. Yeah, totally. I love that. Um, okay, so three questions I ask to wrap up every episode. Okay. Just the very first one is what motivates you? Um, just, you know, that life is interesting and people are interesting and... Um, I enjoy the creative experience. So that's what motivates me. I enjoy expressing. I like that. What advice would you give to your younger self and younger people listening now starting out down a similar path? I think you answered this a little For bit my, Yeah, and by my younger self, I'd say like, just st don't be so hard on yourself and don't try to make everything perfect. Just be, just be and, and relax and appreciate the gifts you've been given. I like that. All right, last question. This is the hardest one. If you could only see one show for the rest of your life, but you could see it as many times as you want, what would you see? <laughs> uh, a theater show? Any show you want. I don't know. That's a hard one to answer because uh, I don't know that I can answer that question right now. Oh, I can. Uh, you know what? No, there's just too many that I love. <laughs> what, uh, what came to mind for a second? Well, you know... <laughs> I've always loved, and I've watched it a hundred million times, Men in Black. I love that movie. Really? I've always loved that movie. The first one. Yeah. And then there's the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie. There is uh, there is um, uh, the film version of the ruling class. Like, there's a bunch of weird stuff that I like. So, but I, this, that can't answer that with one thing. <laughs> you plead, I just can't. Plead the fifth. All right. Fair enough. So then where can we find you? Where can we find your guy posting on your social media accounts? Um, on Instagram. <laughs> Instagram. Yeah. What's, what's your username? Uh, I don't even know. Um, <laughs> I don't know what it is. I don't. All right. Well, I'll find it. I'll put yeah, it, you'll find I'll it. I'll put it, it in the show notes. Yeah. I don't know what it is because I don't post, I, I rarely post. Is your TikTok profile you never posted on i TikTok? don't do okay. a tiktok i just watch okay i don't have a tiktok profile i have an instagram post uh profile which you can look up and i have and i'm on facebook oh i love but it but that's like grandma land you know facebook apparently is for old people listen i mean this episode get posted there it's, it's i don't post you know i, I rarely I post i rarely I post think i will anyway okay uh, well i'm on instagram tiktok threads facebook oh see I'm, that's too much you're telling me <laughs> It's too much to keep track uh, of. Leave a rating and a review wherever you're listening. Thanks to Jukebox the Ghost for the intro and outro music. And Mary, thank you most of all. And My inviting pleasure. me into your lovely home again. Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Take a deep breath. Make the world a little colorful.